Welcome everyone. I'm Jake Grombach. I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of Washington. Um, welcome to this wiser webinar, Voting Rights Under Attack. Um, we have an outstanding panel. Um, before I introduce our illustrious panel, I wanted to thank uh, Sophia Wallace, the director of the Wiser Washington Institute on Inequality and Race, and Rucker Ceballos, who's the uh, grad student uh, uh, sort of director of the program as well, um, for putting together this great panel. Um, so uh, right now I'll go around and introduce our panelists. So we have Charlotte Hill of uh, UC Berkeley, Adrian Jones of Morehouse College, Bertral Ross of the University of Virginia School of Law, and Janelle Wong of the University of Maryland. Thanks so much for being here and thanks uh, to our audience for taking the time uh, out of your day to hear about uh, American democracy and voting rights. Um, so we have a ton to cover. This is a really important time a ton has been happening in recent days on these issues in American politics. So uh, I'd like to just jump right in. So the way I see it, there are three or at least three major crises facing American elections and electoral democracy. The first is voter suppression. The second is gerrymandering and bias districting. And the third is electoral subversion. Voter suppression makes it more difficult for Americans, especially uh, uh, Americans of lower income, Black Americans, um, and others to vote. Gerrymandering makes individuals vote count more or less in terms of how much they affect uh, uh, legislative control of state legislatures in the U.S. House. And electoral subversion is the potential for state legislatures or state attorneys general to award electoral college votes to a presidential candidate that does not win uh, their state's electorate. Each of these uh, appear to be uh, uh, threatening American democracy right now. So I wanna talk uh, with you all about the state of each of these crises. Where do you see uh, threats coming from right now? Um, what should uh, focus be on? Um, how should we understand these problems? So um, uh, I'd like actually just anyone who uh, is interested to first jump in. And if not, I'm happy to cold call, but I know all of you are experts in these areas. So. So jump right in and don't be shy. I'll jump in because uh, I've been feeling frustrated with how some of the national conversation about um, whether or how to prioritize one or more of these areas over others has been playing out over the past couple of weeks. Um, and Jake, I know, I know you know about this because we <laughs> express our frustration to each other all the time via text. Uh, really there's been a an argument pushed by a lot of media pundits uh, lately that election subversion is the only thing that is uh, worth prioritizing right now and that in particular democracy policy advocates uh, organizers should stop focusing on voting rights and voting suppression um, there's also been uh, folks saying, hey, gerrymandering doesn't look too bad this year, so maybe we, we don't need to focus on that so much either. Um, you know, I'll say right now that I, I think we really do need to be giving ample attention to voter suppression, not at the expense of the other things, but suppression deserves uh, to be a major focus uh, right now because it's bad. You know, Shelby, 2013, huge blow to voting rights, and we're still seeing the consequences today, you know, voter registration purges dramatically increasing. Uh, between 2014 and 2016 alone, states removed 16 million people from the voting rolls. We see, yeah, voter ID laws, which a lot of people like to focus on as kind of a, a quintessential example of voter suppression, but uh, restrictions to who can request a mail ballot, restrictions on registration drives, removal of drop boxes in disproportionately, you know, uh, urban areas, areas serving people of color. Um, as we saw in Georgia, making it illegal to give voters food or water. You know, these are, these, these policy changes absolutely do have an effect. And if the voting process itself is biased so dramatically uh, that one political party gets a major leg up in elections, then you may not even, uh, th that party may not even need to engage in election subversion in order to have controlled who won and subverted the will of the people. Um, so th this is my argument that suppression needs to be uh, up there on the, on the agenda. 
it would be my argument that all three are voter suppression. <clears throat> you know, if you're subverting the will of the people, um, you're suppressing the votes. And my concern about the electorate now is that everyone needs to understand that they need to vote. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people who say, oh, I don't vote. They seem to take pleasure in telling me this. <laughs> um, or um, they question how important their vote is. Um, so for students, like that's ridiculous, right? You, you, students can make a sea change in the electorate right now. But my concern is that because they are tooling with the voting framework, the next step is to make voting irrelevant. So part of the job now is to vote for what you want so that you can exercise your freedoms. Part of the job now is to vote, to maintain the system as one that tolerates a vote such that um, we actually have the option to participate in what the nation or the democracy is gonna look like. We already have significant corporate influence, which tends to be much bigger than any of the checks any of us individually can cut. So um, if only to win, I don't know, my students are competitive. So like, maybe you don't like voting, do it anyway. So you can, you can win. You, you can you can have achieved something that um, has some lasting power that's really important. <laughs> Professor Jones makes a great point about the combination of voter suppression and other policies making it harder to participate while also a large number of Americans feel isolated and alienated from the political process and that their vote doesn't really matter. And those are two challenges for American democracy. Professor Ross and Professor Wong. I, mean, I guess we have to um, understand and, and just remember the context in which um, election subversion, voter suppression, and gerrymandering has taken place um, and who is doing it. Um, the context is one in which historically um, the more marginalized and alienated classes of voters have tended to be voters of color and low income voters um, who have a, a at least a a policy orientation that favors um, Democrats, not that they will necessarily vote Democratic, but they have a policy orientation to vote Democrats, to vote Democratic. And you have Republican led legislatures that are leading efforts to um, suppress the vote, make their vote meaningless, and to give people or to lead people to lose confidence in the election. And what that will have the effect of doing is leading these marginal, less frequent voters to not turn out to vote. Even if they do not face real barriers to voting, they may decide that voting is just not worth it. That, you know, even the, the chance of winning doesn't really get me anything because I cannot win. Just think about sort of the effects of gerrymandering. We focus a lot on whether there's a partisan bias that's being produced by gerrymandering. What's often overlooked is that what gerrymandering do, is doing is cementing durable majorities in state legislatures, creating entirely uncompetitive districts for Congress, and leading to elections that simply do not matter. They are contested, but they're not really contested. And since they are not competitive, nobody is going out and reaching out to these voters to tell them why their vote should matter. The only elections that tend to matter tend to be these statewide elections as district elections have become essentially meaningless. So that's quite harmful to the, to the project of broadening out the vote. And then you combine it with voter suppression, raising costs even marginally on these individuals to vote when they don't really have that much confidence that their vote will matter has a pretty large effect. And since voting tends to be habit forming and non-voting tends to be habit forming too, it has long-term consequences as well. So, I mean, I agree that all of these are kind of forms of voter suppression, right? Election subversion, at least the threat of it will give a sense that even if I do vote and even if my team does win, they might still lose, right? Those are all diminishing confidence in, in voting um, that have harmful effect and distorting effects on a democracy. I agree with uh, my fellow panelists and just wanted to show a quick graphic here. Um, you know, I think that voter suppression is is the key issue. What's driving it? And I think we can agree that, or maybe not, but I think together demographic change, white anxiety, and partisan panic are coming together in a really potent way. And you end up with these triple crises. 
So we have ample evidence now that, you know, Republicans, especially white Republicans, are really worried about something that's called like the reverse golden rule that we will, that they will, you know, that people of color will do to them what they have been doing to others, and that they believe now that discrimination against whites is as big a problem as discrimination against blacks. If you look at this other data on, you know, whether people who thinks immigrants invading the U.S. are uh, are invading the U.S. and changing American culture, again, you can see it's it's really quite partisan and white evangelicals, the core of the of the Republican base, have deep fears about demographic change combined with the uh, kinds of institutional levers that my co-panelists have been mentioning, we get to the situation we have now. I will also just say that, you know, um, I was, I, I want to bring up Shelby again, because that case, uh, you know, it shows us, I think, that these problems started earlier. And Shelby, of course, uh, was a prohibited um, or made, made it certain that when there were changes to voting laws that the federal government would not be able to review those and challenge them. And who was behind that, uh, that particular case? It was this guy, Ed Bloom. And Ed Bloom is also behind another case I was involved in, which is um, the Harvard voting rights, I mean, sorry, the Harvard affirmative action case. This is about the the idea of ensuring that racial discrimination goes unchecked in US life. And so I just want to provide that background context about the forces behind these kinds of moves. Thanks. Uh, yeah, on, let's continue on this great point that uh, Professor Wong brought up. So race is clearly central to so much of what we're talking about here um, from January 6th uh, and the sort of insurrection at the Capitol and Confederate flags being flown in that, the fact that mass politics is really dominated by race and cultural resentment based politics um, in understanding vote choice and partisanship currently in ways uh, it hasn't been uh, in other periods, um, plus uh, uh, issues of voting rights in uh, the judiciary, like the Shelby v. Holder decision in 2013, which essentially the the uh, Professor Ross can, uh, our, uh, legal expert can correct me if I'm wrong, but a uh, part of the rationale for ending Section Five of the vote, gutting the Section Five of the Voting Rights Act, was that racism was not the same problem that it was in 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was passed. Um, we know all these elements. We also know. Uh, that uh, there are different issues of the cost of voting across racial groups and so much more. But so it's race is clearly central, but I'm wondering how it's central in how we're thinking about American democracy struggles uh, for American democracy in the past and the present. So can I just add something to what um, Dr. Wong was saying? about this historical piece and Ed Blum, which really gets me excited because Ed Blum is like a reverse civil rights activist, right? It's not just um, Shelby and you said um, the, the Harvard case, it's it's also the Texas, this the Fisher, right? I mean, yep. my man is, he's focused um, and he's got space to work right now. <clears throat> so I keep hearing on the television, for example, that in 2006, Republicans supported the Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which covers these laws that uh, Dr. Wong was talking about, right? So changes in the voting law get reviewed. Okay, so I studied the 2006 hearings and these people did not agree with the Voting Rights Act in 2006. My state legislators, legislators after agreeing to reauthorize the thing, led what I have described as a rebellion in Congress where they fought hard about whether or not Section 5 should be reauthorized. They also, um, for the first time in history, replaced the Senate report. So apparently this is a bipartisan report that gets passed around. Everybody talks about what happened in a particular hearing. After the 2006 hearings, um, GOP representatives rewrote that document, did not share it with Democrats, and um, outlined their complaints. Six days later, they challenge, Mr. Blum challenges the law, right? Which turns into that North Austin Municipal Utility District number one versus Holder case, 
which leads you to Shelby. So I'm saying this was not like a surprise. It just feels like a surprise to the greater public. <clears throat> um, in looking at congressional reauthorizations of Section 5 over time, there was never a point at which there was peace. There was never a point at which Southern Democrats and then later Republicans were in agreement with preclearance, not one time. So, I mean, in fact, this was the result of a long development of how are we going to politically effectively <clears throat> counter this law. And so in 2006, we're gonna pass it, we're gonna complain, and then we're gonna challenge it in court. And I guess I would say in terms of thinking about race in the context of democratic developments and the law of democracy and, and, and so on, race is Black people, just to be direct, are the target and boogeyman in our multiracial democratic project. They're the target for voter suppression and historically have been so. They're the target for gerrymandering, either whether you want to pack them in a district to limit their influence on other districts that surround them or crack them so that they have no influence in the, in the districts that they're in. Um, and they're also the boogeyman. They're the boogeyman that um, as a subjugated minority in our country, a minority that has been hated, that's feared, that's distrusted, that is seen as un-American, that is seen as outsiders. They are the boogeyman to um, the what has been historically the mostly white electorate. And the fear that those that um, seek to make the Black folks a boogeyman seek to inspire is this fear of Black domination, Black rule, and what that would mean. And what that would mean to, to, to many white folks is, you know, some of the things that President Trump said during his, um, during his time in office, in which he talked about those, um, um, I forget the language he used, other countries that are predominantly Black, and basically leads us to analogize what it would be like to have Black control and Black domination in our country. So I think it's central to um, the, the efforts to undermine and undercut the multiracial democratic project, the targeting and the making of the boogeyman um, um, Black people in the United States. Thanks. And uh, I want to just think we're getting a great uh, question already in the q and I'd encourage our audience members to submit more questions in the Q&A. Um, this one so far is actually, it's so good that I want to just jump in with this question about historical continuity and change with respect to multiracial democracy in the U.S., thinking to both moments of big change, reconstruction, then later uh, the civil rights revolution of the mid-20th century, and then potentially now, as well as continuity. The question brings up a great question about long-lasting, for example, subnational authoritarianism in the US over the long term. So when we think about voting rights stability and change over, for example, the past generation, sort of where we are, where are we compared to history and sort of how would we understand the health of American democracy across time? Uh, Dr. Hill, why don't you uh, jump in on your sense of sort of where voting rights have been over this past generation? Uh, it's, I mean, it's a hard question and I'm eager to hear other people's perspectives. Um, I think uh, something I've heard folks bring up uh, recently when I've talked about how, you know, suppression is a big problem, we need to address it, is folks saying, and especially analogizing to Jim Crow, is people saying, well, you had folks getting lynched, right? I mean, you had, you had terrible things happening during Jim Crow. We don't have that today. Um, and I, I think it's, I don't know how helpful it is to get into a kind of tit for tat, how, how bad were things 60 years ago versus how bad are they today? Because we are so far today from a functioning competitive democracy where everyone's voice counts equally. Like, I don't think our standard for a successful democracy should be not Jim Crow, right? It, it needs to be the presence of a suite of things that do not exist right now. But I do also often like to remind people um, you know, we have amazing work on the new Jim Crow and we have millions of 
of people of color disproportionately, Black Americans, Black men disproportionately getting locked up, um, incarcerated, and then denied the ability due to that incarceration to participate in our electoral process. I, I was thinking this morning, stepping back, you know, are people going to look back when they have some remove from this era and say, and, and think, excuse my cat, uh, and think about uh, about this new Jim Crow period and, and say, what a terrible, what a terrible atrocity. People were taken from their families. People were locked in cages and unable to, uh, to, to use their voice to shape the laws governing society. I mean, it, it feels as viscerally awful as some previous moments during American democracy when, when again, disproportionately Black Americans were treated as subhuman. So like we can make some of these comparisons, but I also always like to, to remind ourselves like the Jim Crow era is not the standard by which we should be gauging the success of our democracy. That's a nice point, and I'll make a quick social science point when it comes to understanding American democracy over the past generation, that the neglect of understanding mass incarceration, that the U.S. has more individuals under correctional control and in prison than any authoritarian regime in terms of numbers and per capita, and that that bias of social science um, and the lack of attention to uh, really scholars of uh, race and Black politics and Black history in the U.S., that inattention led to kind of overly optimistic uh, assessments of American democracy in the post-Jim Crow period. Um, Professor Wong, you were going to jump in, I believe. Well, I, I wanted to just build on this point of what's similar and what's different. We are in a multiracial democracy, but I will say you know, during that era of Jim Crow, who was holding up the fight for voting rights, Black people, and I hope you'll indulge another screen share here, um, that today, who is really holding up the rights for other people of color who may not always be loyal allies to the cause, here you can see that for immigration law, right? Black people, 10% are immigrants. Asian Americans, over 70% of adults or around 70% of adults are immigrants. But Black people are more likely to support legal immigration that has benefited Asian Americans than Asian Americans. If you look at this chart, this is my last one, that Black Americans are more likely to say that Asian Americans face discrimination than Asian Americans and that immigrants face discrimination than, you know, than Asian Americans, a majority uh, immigrant group. And so this, again, you know, yes, there is uh, the same fears are driving uh, the, the moment today. And once again, who is at the forefront? Which groups are at the forefront of fighting for rights? It is still Black Americans. That is a very nice Du Boisian point from Professor Wong about uh, Black Americans on the vanguard of uh, civil rights and democracy. Um, great. Uh, more on this. I'd like to uh, think more broadly. So uh, again, thinking uh, both comparing to history and contrasting, but thinking about uh, longstanding issues of U.S. constitutional institutions that really go back to the founding, some of which have changed in important ways, uh, the use of the filibuster, the direct election of senators uh, and uh, presidents and so forth, um, but also huge continuity in American constitutional institutions. How much is uh, of the sort of issues facing multiracial American democracy are new issues of uh, sort of innovations in gerrymandering, voter suppression, subversion, and the like, and how much stems back to issues of the design of the Constitution in the late 18th century and how it applies to contemporary American politics, racial geography, political conflict, you know, contemporary economic circumstances, and so much more. Okay. Go for it. Um, so before we got on the call, we were talking about, <clears throat> you know, how we have to do this work again. And I guess I want to recognize for myself that this is a through line, right? It's not a new Jim Crow. We were very adept at Jim Crow. And before Jim Crow it was slavery. So it wasn't even no Jim Crow. <laughs> it was just like, you cannot. I also need people to understand that the constitution is designed to minimize mass uprising. <laughs> 
right? So I mean, it's the filibuster, it's the electoral college, it's the, um, the representation period, right? I'm voting for somebody to go down to DC to represent me, right? They don't want me to show up, me and my, my neighborhood or whatever, right? And then black people and, um, I mean, cause there's a race class element, right? So black people have a lot in common. I study black people and their political de development in the United States, but I'm clear that I should be studying poor white people because the point of the racism is to separate the masses so that, so that elites may control those who are best um, facilitated to be leaders, right? So I'm saying, I don't think people understand that we are in the same process. White supremacy is not going down without a fight. So it's gonna involve backlash. It means um, a couple few hundred years of work. Um, and it is becoming more obvious in this current stage that, um, for example, the election laws that have been passed, they don't just affect me and the people who look like me. They affect other voters who do not have and I mean white voters who do not have the flexibility of someone in the, you know, ex who's extremely wealthy, who can go drop box whenever they want to or vote whenever they want to. And these things are tied together. Um, but white supremacy is designed not to have you notice that. And I really need people to get that so that they are self motivated to um, express what Dr. Wong is saying, which is like, have a recognition for what is happening. With, for yourself and for the other people. And these things impact you. Um, I hear it on the podcast and so forth that I listen to and they wanna talk about this week and what happened with voting. I can just feel that like, they think it has nothing to do with them. <laughs> it has something to do with you. I just wanna kind of build off of those very important points. Um, you know, our country was founded as an aristocratic republic. We, they designed our institutions such that the natural aristocracy would exercise power. The natural aristocracy was known, uh, was said by them to be those of virtue, but what it really meant was those of wealth. And even though we've gone through a period of Jacksonian democracy, which expanded the franchise and opportunities to serve to white people in the 1830s and 40s. And even though we had the Reconstruction moment, which had a special period in the early 1870s, where there was actual hope that we may get to a multiracial democracy, the very institutions and structures that were built into the aristocratic system at the very beginning remained. Those include large congressional districts if we're looking at the federal level, which means that those of only means and reputation can win those office at, at a general level. We have statewide, um, uh, uh, we have senators that are elected by states and every state gets an equal number of them. So that in the highly more highly populous states, which tends to have more people of color, they tend to be disproportionately unrepresented in that institution. And then we have, of course, the electoral college, which was a system that leads to and can lead to and has led to minority um, elected presidents. Now we've had that moment, that brief moment in which we had black office holders and widespread turnout in the early 1870s um, went away with massive voter suppression and white supremacist resistance. Um, and it took us 80, 80 years, 90 years to recover. And so that ultimately led to the Voting Rights Act, which tried to counter some of these structural challenges. It countered some of them by creating majority minority districts that gave um, people of color a true opportunity to elect their representatives of choice, even in these large districts that are typically controlled by um, white and, and wealthy politicians. It also tried to set up, um, uh, it also provided opportunities for um, or limited the opportunities for states to pass laws that suppress the vote. And so that was kind of the moment and we could keep coming back to Shelby County. And the Shelby County decision was a huge setback for this entire project. The Supreme Court, you know, as you as you mentioned, um, Jake, you know, 
treated as uh, it made it seem like we had we had we made it right. We had two elections in which African African Americans have voted more than than white folks. They they demonstrated higher registration. Of course, the two elections in which we had um, the first and only black president right on the ballot. Um, what that ultimately ignored um, was that still because of our structures that are in place. Blacks are are almost are, are very much underrepresented in politics. And I don't mean in the terms of descriptive sense. I mean in a substantive sense. Their views, their wants, their needs are neglected. And the problem that our system has always faced in terms of black folks and people of color is that there is nowhere else to go. There's only one party that's willing to claim you. The other party is entirely rejecting you. And that party is willing to claim you can and, and has taken you for granted. And so we're still in a situation of, of, of great inequality um, and representation in, in our democracy that no longer is entitled to the protection that the Voting Rights Act, um, or that Black people are no longer entitled to the protections the Voting Rights Act gave them, and the courts have completely neglected the issue. This is great. I want to keep pushing on this issue of American institutions um, and how they reverberate through American democracy and, uh, and politics. So uh, Professor Ross mentioned on one hand, you have constitutional institutions that compared to other wealthy democracies or semi-democracies are very unique. The U.S. has a system of separation of powers and checks and balances, provides huge authority to the state level for democratic institutions like election administration and districting. It has a Senate, which is uh, currently malapportioned by population, um, and uh, it has through all these has a huge number of veto points, making it harder to pass national policy uh, with legislative majorities than parliamentary systems. Then, so those are constitutional features. Then you have this sort of uh, civil rights legislation era of, we're talking a lot about the Voting Rights Act through to now state level voting policy, voter suppression, or also a question mentions expansion of voting access in states like Washington State, Go Huskies, and Colorado, um, uh, which have provided things like universal uh, mail balloting, Dropbox, uh, automatic voter registration, and so forth. Um, uh, Professor Hill and Professor Wong, uh, what do you think of the, uh, of the sort of two sides here, the constitutional institutions and these new changes in the post-civil rights era in terms of legislation for essentially like how democratic the U.S. currently is, particularly when it comes to voting in elections. I'll let Professor Wong jump in first. Well, I have only a little to say on the on the constitutional side, you know, I think it's pretty clear that the Constitution's the enforcement of constitutional provisions has really varied over time. And Professor Jones, I think, can speak to this most clearly, which is that these nefarious forces will use uh, provisions like the 14th Amendment to attack racial justice in the name of colorblindness. They're, it's not a guarantee, right? And you've written extensively on this topic. On the state side, and I'm interested to hear what Professor Hill has to say about it, you know, of course, we do see that the states are both expanding and contracting. Um, you know, Ohio's Supreme Court actually overturned the um, their redistricting commission's maps earlier this week, I think. And you know, what did those show? That this commission that we all had high, maybe not all, but I had high hopes in, really designed some maps that were still designed by those who had been, there was still a hand of elected officials in the drawing of those maps. And so we ended up with maps where, you know, 45% or 54% of the, the public in these legislative elections supports Republicans. And the maps showed, uh, you know, almost 70% of the representatives would be um, Republican. And so there, I think maybe the states are still our only hope, but I'm still pretty wary. Sure. What, what, what we've seen in the past few, let's say the past decade, two decades, um, and uh, Professor Grumbach's research also points to this, is that we are we have two different political systems emerging, one in blue states, one in red states. Um, certainly there are federal election laws and, and constitutional structures that shape 
what is possible uh, in each of those systems, but we have increasingly um, uh, improving democratic access and influence in uh, for voters in blue states, potential voters in blue states, and um, worsening uh, access and influence in red states. And it can be frustrating as an academic in this space uh, when folks will point to aggregate improvements in access and influence um, or point to specific cases of, well, look at how Washington state is passing all of these reforms or even suggest that we don't need to be too concerned or there is hope. Uh, there's there's you know, reason to be optimistic about the future of democracy because look at um, these 20 states that have, have past improvements to voting laws. And the reality is that because of the constitutional biases toward red states right now, um, the laws that are then passed within those states that restrict the franchise have a disproportionate impact on overall uh, control of federal government and the overall trajectory of our democracy. And it's not going to be sufficient in my read uh, to pass improvement after improvement in democratically controlled states because they simply do not have um, fair uh, representation at the level of Congress and the Senate to be able to translate those state level changes into eventually federal um, pro-democracy policy. So I'm really concerned. I don't, I, I think my read is that there's probably one more shot in the near future to pass federal democracy reforms. It's, it's going to be really hard uh, to even gain the political power at the federal level uh, to be able to have another go at something like a, a Freedom to Vote Act uh, or a John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, and that's going to be, you know, if uh, the pro-democracy forces are able to retain control of the House and secure a larger um, majority in the Senate in 2022. And right, right now, the, the projections are not looking great, but I certainly know folks on the ground who are doing the really critical organizing work are, um, that's what they're talking about. They're saying, you know, we've got one more year to, to try to get this done. Thanks, Dr. Hill. We'll come back to this, what is to be done at these different levels, uh, you know, in elite politics and for ordinary uh, people who want to be activists and organize and vote. Um, I, I uh, want to, uh, mention highlight a, a point you just made as well that just with US democratic institutions like election administration being at the state level constitutionally what happens in one state affects representation throughout the system so it would be pretty absurd if somebody during Jim Crow is like well you know northern states like Illinois are kind of trending better so like the national average is getting better so who cares about you know Jim Crow in Alabama um uh, so I just want to highlight that. Uh, Professor Jones, you want to jump in? I don't. I just thought that was entertaining. Okay. That's a very good well, example. <laughs> happy, to, happy to hear that. But yeah, so election administration at the state level uh, uh, regulates voting from dog catcher up to U.S. president. Um, so this is something that uh, scholars of federal, critical scholars of federalism, you know, Jamila Michener, uh, Phil Rocco, Lisa Miller, and others have really focused on how this the US has a tremendous number of elections across uh, you know across these levels of government and yet uh, not all that much uh, uh, democracy in some uh, some sort of areas of this. All right um actually so why don't we uh, we've just had uh, a failed vote to remove the filibuster uh, for voting rights and uh, sort of anti-gerrymandering legislation potentially also, for electoral count act reform in terms of election subversion. Is there sort of, what is your sense of the, of feelings about the Biden administration and democratic Congress um, at this point? And what do you think was, you had anticipated, you had not anticipated uh, your feelings about the potential for uh, legislation on uh, directional, you know, directed at uh, voting rights, but also things that impact democracy in my interests, like, you know, uh, uh, labor unions, for example, have played an important role in American democracy and civil rights. And that, for example, national legislation around labor relations and labor rights could also play a role in democracy. But how are you all feeling um, on this January 21st, 
2022? I guess, I, I guess I'll say that um, I, with respect to the Biden administration and Congress, I, I, I just been always surprised with respect to the two voting bills, um, the optimism about bipartisanship as a means by which these bills would pass. Um, Biden had that optimism that, um, you know, Republicans would come to some epiphany when um, he came into office and that there would be negotiation, cooperation on a whole variety of fronts. Um, and I guess I expected, you know, maybe on things that are not particularly partisan, although they become more so like infrastructure, you know, maybe you get that through. But when it comes to voting, this is at the core of the identity of the Republican Party, right? It's not really a party of many ideas right now. It doesn't really have much in terms of policy prescriptions. It's entire reason for being, at least right now, is to get power and to stay in power. And what that requires is to do whatever it takes in the voting realm. And so any sort of idea that somehow Democrats can get Republicans to go along with a plan that would limit their ability to do whatever they wanted in the voting realm seemed quite delusional to me. Um, I was also, I guess a, a second point I would say is it's just the frustration with how they prioritize voting, um, particularly President Biden. I understand we're in a pandemic. We have a lot of crises going on. Um, it was important to pass the, 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 the early bill that provided money and stimulus to our economy and to people that desperately needed it. But this law for the People Act and now the Freedom to Vote Act is S1, HR1. These are the top priority. And yet so little was said or done about it for so long. And by the time anything is said about it, we have a president whose approval ratings aren't particularly good. Um, his ability to um, get the American people on the side of this issue is not particularly strong. And we're at a point where, you know, we're facing an election that seems rather hopeless um, in 2022, which pretends for bad things to come in 2024 um, in terms of election subversion and other matter. So it's worrisome, disappointing, um, and, and, and frustrating. Okay. <laughs> um, it's just so much. I feel overwhelmed. Um, so a few minutes ago, we were talking about how like only one party will accept the Black people. Right now, it's the Democrats, you know, before it was the Republicans. But, um, you know, as a Black person, like, the Democratic Party is not all pro-Black, just like the Republican Party was by no means pro-Black, right? In my own state, as soon as um, the uh, state legislature got seated during Reconstruction and approved the 14th Amendment and got reintroduced into the Union, um, on a bipartisan basis, they kicked out all the black legislators who could be identified, right? Except for those who were too light skinned. And they just, I guess they just stayed really still. I don't know why this is happening. Um, but I feel like today the same thing is true, right? It's not as if the Democratic Party um, is pro black. And I have had the sense, although I have no justification for this, having not really read or studied about it. Um, that this attraction to the white median voter just persists. And the impact that the former president is having on his party is not limited to his party. So I get the impression that the Biden administration was reticent about entering the fight about voting rights, right? They came down here to my own campus um, to give me a speech which basically tells me current history. Now I know the current history. I need to understand, do you, can you do something about the filibuster? Can, you know, do, where were you last week or last month? Because the, the ability of people to vote impacts even the legislative success that the administration has had. Um, so while I am disappointed, <clears throat> I don't think it's surprising that the Biden administration wants to be seen as having attempted to do something 
um, when I'm not confused about the fact that you didn't do it, you did not get this done. And this is critical um, in 2022 and 2024. I'd like to uh, keep going on that. To what extent is non-responsiveness to Black Americans, their concerns, their plight, not uh, is that related to institutions or sort of, you know, political behavior and strategy? So I'll say, you know, Black Americans currently about 14% of the U.S. population in a institutional structure that is going to create a two-party system. So as Paul Freimer and others have written, that creates the circumstances for a captured constituency where the strongest threat Black Americans have is to say, we're going to stay home because the Democratic Party did not uh, support me in terms of policy. And that threat is unfortunately not as strong as that of a swing voter in a geographically efficient location, for example, in a Midwestern state and Obama to Trump voter who we've heard so much about. Um, what can uh, 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 Americans who are uh, focused on see these issues of racial justice and American democracy do? And how do we understand the current sort of racial politics? There's been a huge change in the tenor of racial politics. We're coming from a 2020 that saw, for example, white opinion on uh, racial attitudes seeming to become more progressive over time, then quickly switch back. Where are we in terms of uh, racial politics, both at the mass level and in that institutional and sort of party level? Well, I'll, I'll answer quickly, since I know we're kind of running out of time, that what can, what can the everyday person do? You know, I think one lesson from these past efforts at voter suppression is that to some extent, you can counter those moves, obviously not in terms of the, you know, locking in partisan advantages, but you can counter some voter suppression um, efforts with mobilization and especially voter education. And I think we have to give um, especially grassroots organizations the credit for doing that. On the other hand, Stacey Abrams can't do everything. And I think that is really, kind of where we're at right now, it's like the Democratic Party is just thinking Stacey Abrams is going to take care of all this. No, and it's way too much pressure. And that's not, we, we can take that model and we should, but it's, she can't do everything. I also think we're at real risk of what I'm going to call democracy burnout or democracy activist burnout. Um, you can't ask people to keep setting aside the rest of their lives to fight and fight and fight and do everything they can. How I'm imagine I'm guessing many people on this call have engaged in their texting campaigns and been calling voters and trying to turn them out and emailing their friends and family and sounding the alarm, uh, which is important. Uh, but I don't think that kind of work is sustainable. Uh, we don't have the right institutions set up to support uh, that kind of work in the long term. And um, so I, it also makes me concerned that some of the types of voter suppression that we've seen in the past that in the literature appear to maybe not have dramatically changed electoral outcomes that they may gain in efficacy uh, the longer they exist. Because uh, you know if they have been um, if we haven't seen clear impacts at the get-go, in part because folks have been counter-mobilizing on the ground and the counter-mobilization efforts just can't continue forever, um, eventually maybe those voter ID laws do start really depressing turnout. That's an excellent point. Your own research, Dr. Hill, has talked about uh, the potential for this sort of backlash to voter suppression types of effects that can mobilize uh, voters like in the sort of Stacey Abrams sense, um, and also the diminishing sort of capacity of that counter mobilization across time. I'll also highlight that the big success of Stacey Abrams Georgia model also interacted with Georgia's automatic voter registration prior to these new voter suppression laws. So uh, it's important to think about that with respect to that, as well as 
you know, Chief Justice John Roberts claim of, you know, look at the tremendous turnout in the Obama presidential elections as sort of evidence against um, the need for uh, voting rights. Um, more on sort of what can be done both at uh, the elite level the, and the sort of mass level and organizational level, as well as media. How do you think sort of contemporary punditry, uh, cable news, the newspapers are covering the uh, uh, democracy issues in the context of the Biden presidency? I guess I'll say, you know, <laughs> the media is, is, is a further source of, of diminished hope, um, <laughs> frankly. Um, I think that there's this danger of creating a sense of, you know, false equivalency with respect to the crises that the two presidents have faced. Um, the crises that Biden has faced and sort of the, the, you know, obstacles and failures, if you want to call them that, are based in policy, right? Efforts to pass laws that um, he thinks and the supporters thinks and the Democrats think are for the public good. Whereas what we saw in the last presidency were um, failures at attempts to aggrandize power for oneself for no re reason other than to capture power and to advance and to do so through a racial divide and conquer strategy that has historically been used um, by the Republican Party um, over the last 50 years and um, prior to that by the Democratic Party during um, Reconstruction and Redemption. And so I think that in going back to the broader point that, that you were, um, that the question that you raised in terms of the institutional behavioral factors, I'll go back to what I said earlier, so long as um, black folks are the vilified minority, in a two-party system, it's going to raise a conundrum for the party that ostensibly represents Black folks, because to the extent that they're seeking that median white voter, and there is that risk that that median white voter may not like Black people that much, that we do not necessarily want to be too much the party of Black people to attract that median white voter. This is the Clinton strategy. This has been the strategy of Democrats for a long time. And so the structural dynamics are there. How do we overcome that? It's a deep cultural, you know, as uh, Professor Jones was saying, deep cultural need to overcome white supremacy. Only till we completely dismantle white supremacy and in, in, in favor of true racial egalitarianism, not temporary, not passing racial egalitarianism, but true deep and substantive racial egalitarianism, we're gonna be faced with this problem uh, um, until that point comes. And I'd like to be hopeful that that point will come, but um, it's, 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 it's hard to maintain that hope sometimes. Professor Ross, I, I have a follow-up question. Do you think that we are any closer to at least having a, a, a more broadly shared national understanding of that problem, of, of how white supremacy plays into, no. <laughs> yeah, Jones I gotta agree with Professor no. Jones. I, I think we talk about it more. Um, maybe we're a little bit more explicit about it, but I don't think we do the deep dive that's necessary to deconstruct and dismantle it. Um, and it just feels a little too superficial right now. Is that transformation something that comes from hearts and minds and uh, individual psychology or from policy change or where has historically changes to essentially mass racism in this case, the ability of political elites to use a, for example, Southern or strategy or a racial resentment based strategy to win pivotal voters what has been the most effective tool against that? Voting Rights Act? I mean, we don't have a, that's the problem. I mean, the thing's called white supremacy, right? So one, you don't wanna accept that you are negatively impacted by it because it says it's giving you supremacy. <laughs> Meanwhile, so you don't even identify the, the issues that are raised for you as a result of the um, rejection of support for black people by the part by the Democratic Party, for example. 
right? You don't even put yourself in the triangle of what's happening, which means you don't understand that white supremacy is injuring you <clears throat> as a populace, right? So, I, don't, I mean, do we change the name? I don't know. <laughs> oh, but I, in my mind, I mean, this panel has convinced me that like, I need to stop, I understand it's third reconstruction time, but I need to stop acting like we had fixed the problem, right? And part of the, the thing is to say, oh, we're, we're here now. We're not there. So, I mean, lynching has not stopped. It has become less uh, popular and obvious. Um, and racism has not stopped. It has become less blatant, but there's always that, um, I can't think of where this comes from, but you've heard people say, you know, one of the things I liked about the deep South was that, you know, it was just clear. I knew who was against me, right? But now we've entered a phase where that's not even true for black people. So like you were messed up when it was Jim Crow and it was clear to black people who the oppressors were. Now we're in like a dog whistle, blatant dog whistleism, where you're three times removed from this energy and this institutional basis that is slowly but surely moving you into authoritarianism. And you your head nodding because um, it seems like it has nothing to do with you. And I feel like changing minds is individual. People will go home and change their mind. They come to the panel and they hear the stuff, but it's not till tonight that the people on this call say, oh, okay. And it's a slow process. You know, it makes me nervous. I'll also say one other thing that appeared to be massive progress that Professor Ross mentioned earlier is the rise of descriptive representation in legislatures. So now actually in Congress, for example, we have about the uh, proportional number of black legislators as to the population. And yet we see these huge threats to democracy as well as the rise of mass incarceration we talked about and so much more, a lack of substantive representation. Um, uh, so we only have three minutes left. We have some great questions, but I'd like uh, anyone, Professor Wong, uh, start, but uh, anyone to jump in with their sort of uh, last thoughts. Um, thanks so much, everyone, as we cut off. Thanks for everyone's time in the audience and our illustrious panelists. This was an outstanding, outstandingly informative uh, discussion for me, I hope for you too. I'll just say I learned a lot. I, I mean, I look forward to this conversation. We, we, we must remain ever vigilant. And I hear the, the worry that we will get, run out of energy. But this what, what everyone is talking about today makes me realize we have to just keep on being vigilant. Learn what the offices are, right? I don't think we're familiar with what the Secretary of State does, for example, or the Comptroller or the Public Service Commissioner. Like, it's our job right now to really become familiar with what it is that offices do and how we can participate in selecting those people. I wanna echo uh, or resurface something that Dr. Jones said earlier in the call, uh, which is that the, what we're facing now isn't as new as it may feel. I have to remind, I, I, you know, I said something kind of contrary to that earlier in this call, I have to remind myself of that. And it can be, there's a way to think of that uh, that feels depressing. Like, oh gosh, we're always fighting these battles. We never win. But for me, there's also a way to take that as energizing and mobilizing. I grew up, I, I have had periods of time in my life when I have felt optimistic about possibilities for this country. And that was within a context that I am sort of now realizing with a bit of remove uh, was, you know, within a context of white supremacy, within a context of continuing battles over. Uh, fair, you know, competitive democracy. So um, we know that we can work through those times because we keep working through those times. We know that victories are possible because victories have been possible in that context before. Um, and so kind of dropping this illusion of, uh, have, of having reached some period of exceptionalism uh, and, and placing ourselves back squarely in the long-term fight in, in a way can be energizing and mobilizing. I guess I'll say very shortly because I know we're totally out of time. There's no silver bullet answer, but I will say education as an anonymous attendee said is the key. And 
one part of the dismantling of the multiracial project, democracy project, is to take away those opportunities to educate on our history um, through different means like critical race theory and, and an understanding of a very factual account of our history. So we're going to have to do it individually, and we're going to have to do it one by one, not necessarily in institutions, to let people know and help people understand our history and our racial past. Thanks, everyone. That was a great way to close out. Um, I really appreciate our panelists' time and expertise on these things. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, keep the faith. Bye. I think they'll.